The Bible reading for today continues our study on the book of Job. Job chapter 28. There is a mine for silver and a place where gold is refined. Iron is taken from the earth and copper is smelted from ore. Mortals put an end to the darkness. They search out the farthest recesses for ore in the blackest darkness. Far from human dwellings they cut a shaft in places untouched by human feet, far from other people they dangle and sway. The earth from which food comes is transformed below by fi- as by fire. Lapis lazu comes from the rocks and its dust contains nuggets of gold. No bird of prey knows the hidden path. No falcon's eye has seen it. Proud beasts do not set foot on it and no lion prowl- prowls there. People assault the flinty rock with their hands and lay bare the roots of the mountains. They tunnel through the rock, their eyes see all its treasures. They search the sources of the rivers and bring hidden things to light. But where can wisdom be found? Where does understanding dwell? No mortal comprehends its worth. It cannot be found in the land of the living. The deep says, it is not in me. The sea says, it is not in me. It cannot be bought with the finest gold, nor can its price be weighed out in silver. It cannot be bought with gold of Ophir, with precious onyx or lapazuli. Neither gold nor crystal can compare with it, nor can it be had for jewels or gold. Coral and jasper are not worthy of mention, The price of wisdom is beyond rubies. The topaz of Cush cannot compare with it. It cannot be bought with pure gold. When then does wisdom come from? Where does understanding dwell? Is it hidden from the eyes of everything living? Concealed even from the birds of the sky? Destruction and death say, only a rumour of it has reached our ears. God understands the way to it and he alone knows where it dwells. For he views the ends of the earth, and he sees everything under the heavens. When he established the force of the wind and measured out the waters, when he made a decree for the rain and a path for the thunderstorm, then he looked at wisdom and appraised it. He confirmed it and tested it, and he said to the human race, the fear of the Lord, That is wisdom, and to shun evil is understanding. But two weeks ago, we met Job. He was wealthy and healthy. He had camels, kids, lots of everything. And he was godly. He was blameless. He feared God. He turned away from evil. But Job lost everything in in that chaotic rush of tragedy, one after another after another, until Job was left weeping in dust and ashes, having lost everything. A piece of broken pottery in one hand he had, scraping sores that covered his body from head to toe. The last week we sat with Job in those dust and ashes, and we felt with him the pain of recognition that it was God who had afflicted him. We saw Job's intense emotional suffering, his, his turmoil and that confidence that it was God who was behind it, God who had permitted it. If it is not God, asked Job in chapter 9, verse 24, then who is it? Well, from chapter 3 on, um, I wonder if you felt this that, the, this, that the book has felt like one long wrestle with the question of why. God, Job claimed, had wronged him. God has treated me unjustly, unjustly, he said. You know I'm not guilty, he cried out to God. You know, his friends tried and and answered to saying, you're a sinner, Job, you you must be. That's the way the world works. Bad things only happen to bad people. So you need to repent to change and fix yourself. That's what his friends said. But Job knew it wasn't true, that he hadn't done any sin to cause his suffering. And so we, so we witness that debate rage back and forward between Job and his friends. Um, now, the book of Job isn't about suffering. We mentioned that in the first week. Um, suffering may be all the way through the book, but suffering isn't its subject. 
Now, the chapter we're in this morning, or today, is chapter 28, is where we, we see most clearly what Job is actually about. Now, it's an odd chapter. In the middle of all that back and forth, the arguments, the sorrow, Job's friends blaming him, Job blaming and accusing God, in the middle of all that, you have this brief moment of calm, a total change in tone, kind of like the eye of the storm or orange slices at half time. Um, the NIV calls it, um, if, you've, if you've got a heading there, calls it an interlude. It's this moment of tranquility. And in that moment, the narrator asks a profound question. In verse 12, and then repeated again in verse 20, he asks, where is wisdom? Where can wisdom be found? Where does understanding dwell? Job is all about when wisdom doesn't work. Um, as, a, as a new parent, I understand, understand this idea well. You know, that moment when you've tried rocking him, you've tried swaying him, you've tried tapping him, you've tried burping him, you've tried changing him and feeding him and shushing him, and he still won't sleep. When wisdom doesn't work, when the world doesn't work out like it should. Now, for Job, this is in the context of his suffering. Job looking for an answer to his suffering, a reason, for his, for, a reason as to why he's gone through it. I haven't done anything to deserve it. Nothing I can think of could have caused it, he says. So why? Job faces a world he thought that he understood, a world he thought he had figured out, and he finds he can't make sense of it. So as we look at this this halftime orange slice of a chapter, um, we're going to pause and reflect on the nature of wisdom. How can we be wise? How can we understand this world when it doesn't work how we think it should? Um, This chapter has three parts. Um, The first is in verses 1 to 11, um, where we see we find pride. Then in verses 12 to 22, where we find humility. And in verses 23 to 28, where we find fear. Um, So first, we're finding pride. Um, If you look down with me at verse 1, we read, There is a mine for silver and a place where gold is refined. Iron is taken from the earth and copper is smelted from ore. Mortals put an end to the darkness. They search out the farthest recesses for ore in the blackest darkness. Um, Avril and I were in South America a few years ago in Bolivia, uh, the city of Potosí, high up in the Andes Mountains. Um, The city is built around Cerro Rico, a mountain and silver mine active since the 16th century. Um, It was the mountain that bankrolled Spain's colonial empire, um, funded the Spanish Armada and all those things. Uh, It's still working today. It has 15,000 workers across 20,000 tunnels. Um, Avril and I, with a few others, spent spent a few hours in some of those tunnels. We climbed up and down ladders. We chatted to miners. We dodged carts trundling past. We heard explosions rumbling in the distance. Um, I can tell you it was a completely different world. And an impressive world at that, I reckon. Impressive what has been done in that mountain mostly with hand tools and dynamite, cutting, chipping, shaping, pulling out tons and tons of silver and other minerals. Job 28 begins with a silver mine, men overcoming darkness to find gold and iron in the earth. In verse 5, they are transforming the earth below as much as fire can transform the earth above. It's huge, right? (laughs) And they're mastering it. They're extracting precious stones, lapis lazuli. I have no idea what that is. I'm sure it sounds precious. Of nuggets of gold. This is all advanced stuff that they're doing. No animal can do it. You, can look, you see that in verse 7. Birds can't even see it. Verse 8, beasts can't achieve what's, what they've done. Um, animals can't do what men have done. Um, in verse 10, they tunnel through the rock, their eyes seeing all its treasures. In verse 11, they bring hidden things to light. Now, the goal of mining is to find something precious. It's pretty obvious, right? The reason so much effort is gone to is because the thing sought for is so highly prized. And it's a hard and a violent search mining. I mean, verse 9, you can see those words. People assault the flinty rock. They lay bare the roots of the mountains. And all of that was before dynamite was even invented. This isn't like a light and casual look around the house for car keys. The path of the miner is the path of one prepared for great effort, danger, possible pain, likely loneliness. It's the path undertaken only by the one who appreciates the value of what they're searching for. And man has mastered it. 
I mean, mining is an incredible and complex endeavor. Um, there's even, that's even more true now um, than it was in, in Job's day. You know, those colossal machines digging tunnels for trains under harbors and cities, those aerial drones using um, mapping mines and things like that, finding deposits, all that kind of thing. The success of man, in, in, the success of man is the pride of man. Look what we can do. Look what we can find. Look what we can lay, lay our eyes on. Look at the value, the preciousness of these things. It's easy to feel pride in the endeavors of man. I mean, the difference that just 10 years makes uh, to the phone that you hold in your hand is huge, isn't it? And the iPhone was only released 13 years ago, if you can believe that. And, um, and, And now maybe many of us couldn't imagine life without the countless conveniences that it brings. When you think about vaccines being produced... Um, recreational trips into space becoming ordinary, um, science seemingly continuing to push the boundaries of human ability, um, progressing us outwards and upwards, philosophy continuing to grow and shift as it's critiqued and sharpened. But though man seems to have great knowledge, though he can even use that knowledge to find what what is of great value, is he wise? I mean, he's found gold and silver, iron and copper. Has he found wisdom? The second part of our passage is the finding of humility. If you look down at me at verse 12, but where can wisdom be found? Where does understanding dwell? No mortal comprehends its worth. It cannot be found in the land of the living. The deep and the sea each say, it's not in me. The question is repeated again in verse 20. And in verse 21, we see again, it's hidden from the eyes of all living things, concealed from the birds of the sky. Um, even if some, somehow man were to communicate with death itself, even if those, the, the mythical guardians of death and destruction themselves from that era were able to be asked where wisdom was, they just shrug their shoulders and say, at best, they've heard, the best they've got is that they've heard a rumor of wisdom kind of on the level of saying that their second cousin worked for a guy who seemed to think he heard a conversation about about it where someone was talking about it at a cafe once, but they really have no idea themselves. Wisdom is hidden from man. No matter where we may be able to go, down to the depths of the sea or to the end of life itself, we cannot find wisdom. Unlike silver and gold, which man, through their ingenuity, can uncover, man cannot find this. They can't just dig it up. No more than the bird or the beast can turn around and start mining silver, can we start finding wisdom. Wisdom is out of our reach. That really flies in the face of our feelings about man, doesn't it? And the trajectory of science and philosophy, the the visions cast by science fiction of using and understanding more and more of the universe, wisdom seems to be within our grasp. Job's case brings that optimism to a halt. Because where on that trajectory is the answer Job is looking for? Where Where is the answer to his suffering? to his asking of why me. Job experienced exactly the futility of the search for wisdom that we see here. He searched for the answer to his question why, but he couldn't find it. And we could search for the answer to Job's suffering. We could search for the answer to our own suffering. We could offer up all kinds of opinions about it, but we could never know. The world is filled with knowledge, opinion, and passion, but it's starving for wisdom. There's great reason for humility in recognizing that wisdom is out of our reach. For there is no point where we will reach a perfect sense of the world, let alone the suffering that's in it. Now, verses 12 and 14 and and 20 to 22, the the narrator laments the inaccessibility of wisdom, kind of two bracketing sections, and in between them is praise, the praise of wisdom for its inestimable value. I mean, look down at verse 15. It cannot be bought with the finest gold, nor can its 
price be weighed out in silver. It cannot be bought with the gold of Ophir, Ophir with precious onyx or lapis lazuli. Neither gold nor crystal can compare with it, nor can it be had for jewels of gold. Coral and jasper are not worthy of mention. The price of wisdom is beyond rubies. The topaz of Cush cannot compare with it. It cannot be bought with pure gold. I mean, you get the idea, right? Wisdom is priceless. No wealth in the world could hope to match it or even to measure it. The treasures of this world are worthless next to it. Wisdom is the most valuable, most desirable thing that we could search or strive for. I wonder if you agree with that. That wisdom, that understanding the world and the way that it works is more valuable for us than for any treasure. When Solomon understood that, didn't he? 1 Kings 3, God said to Solomon, you can have whatever you want, anything at all, power, wealth, health, love, anything. And Solomon said, I want wisdom. I think Job would have understood the value of wisdom. Sitting there in the dust and the ashes, looking at a world he doesn't understand and wanting to know why. The suffering believer is the one who most recognizes the value of understanding. Which kind of leaves us in a bit of a tricky position, doesn't it? Wisdom so far out of our reach and yet so precious and valuable. Like Job, so desperate for answers, longing for them. Job is doomed to, to failure in finding them. It would be a pretty, dep- a pretty depressing passage if it finished there, wouldn't it? Without anywhere to turn in the search for wisdom, in the search for answers in the midst of disappointment, suffering and tragedy. But it doesn't end there. And when we find in the last part of the passage, one way to find wisdom, and that is in the fear of the Lord. Um, look down at verse 23. Um, you'll notice, I, I imagine you'll notice the difference straight away. Verse 23, God understands the way to it and he alone knows where it dwells. For he views the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. When he established the force of the wind and measured out the waters, when he made a decree for the rain and a path for the the thunderstorm, when he looked at wisdom and appraised it, he confirmed it and tested it. Um, I've been hearing a lot about La Nina recently, people saying that it's responsible for the wetter, cooler summer we've been having so far The weather has certainly been unpredictable, hasn't it? One moment sun and a reasonably warm high 20s day, but the next moment, thunder, rain and hail. Weather has to be one of the most uncontrollable, random parts of creation. Wind, rain, thunder, lightning, bringing destruction or blessing, sometimes both at once. I mean, think about the the same day, the same... um, The same storm bringing misery for the bride on her wedding day and yet delight for the farmer during the drought. We may make weak attempts to predict the weather. At least my app is probably probably right maybe half of the time. But for God, the weather is no mystery. In fact, God gives the wind its force. He tells it where to blow. He measures waters. He tells storms where to go. He makes decrees about rain, determining when and where and how much. He controls every bolt and rumble of lightning, preparing their paths. This force of mystery, of destruction and blessing, the weather, God knows it as the one who directs it. This God who knows and directs even the unpredictable random weather. In verse 27, he has looked at wisdom. And throughout this whole section, no one has been able to see or find wisdom. But here in verse 27, God has looked at wisdom. The way to wisdom, the place it dwells, may be impenetrably hidden for us, but not to God. Nothing escapes his vision. Nothing can hide from him or remain a mystery to him. In verse 27, he's like a master jeweler holding up a diamond under a magnifying glass. He's examined it appraised its value, confirmed it, tested it for flaws. God is well acquainted with wisdom. I mean, that makes sense, doesn't it? Because wisdom for God isn't exactly a discovery. Wisdom is given by God. Just as he directs the weather, he has created and structured the world. He has designed its order. He is the architect of its architecture. 
He asks for no explanation about what happens in it. He knows exactly how and why the world works as the one who rules and directs it. There is no event or action whose occurrence God would count as random or unexplainable. Just pause on, on, on that for a moment, right? Because life can feel pretty unpredictable and random, can't it? And suffering can come without warning in an instant. Without reason, like a, like a sudden hailstorm blowing, blowing in, turning a sunny day grey and miserable in minutes. In December 2019, who could predict what the next two years were going to look like? And as we look forward into 2022, I mean, who, who among us can predict what next year will look like? Will we be handed blessing or suffering? When we think about those events in our lives, the ones that feel totally beyond explanation, the ones that make us ask, how could it have happened? Why did it happen? What is a mystery for us isn't a mystery for God. Next year isn't a mystery for God. The last two years don't seem random to him. Our seasons of blessing and suffering, God understands them. Job chapter 28 makes us humble. I think that's its primary function. That despite the impressiveness of humanity's understanding of the world, I mean, it's mining exploits as the example of that. It's um, it's progress and science and philosophy. All of those things, despite that, Real wisdom is completely beyond our grasp. The answers to our questions, why me? Why now? We don't know the answers. We can't know the answers. It's actually arrogance to think that we do. But they do have answers. Answers that God sees. Answers that God knows. And so we look to God as the only one with the answers. And in verse 28, the narrator records God speaking. The fear of the Lord, he says, that is wisdom. And to shun evil is understanding. Fear me and you will be wise. The search for wisdom, more precious than any treasure, invaluable um, with infinite gold, wisdom is found in fearing the Lord. Stop looking for wisdom in the world is what we see here. Stop trying to make your own sense out of what happens and look at the one who sees and knows it all. The path of why leads to the gate of who. Our eyes are directed from architecture to architect. Friends, where is wisdom? Wisdom is in the fear of God. And what does it mean to fear God? Well, to fear God is to think about him rightly, to consider him and his incredible power, in his incredible holiness, the creator, the almighty, the ruler, the director of all things, the one who sustains all things, the one who understands all things. It's really easy to forget those things, isn't it? The greatness of the one that we know and serve. To forget his right to rule the world, to direct the weather, to send the rain and the sunshine, the suffering and the blessing his right to have reasons that he doesn't share with us. It takes humility to admit that understanding why things are as they are, why things happen when they happen and to whom they happen, it takes humility to admit that those things are the domain of God alone, that we don't and can't understand them. It's actually a really vulnerable thing to do, to consider that the only thing we can do, the only way that we can be wise is to entrust ourselves to the one who does know. To fear God and follow his ways. It's really vulnerable to say, I don't know why and I won't know why, but God does and I'll trust him. Um, Next week, we're going to see Job apply this truth. He's going to meet God. He's going to fall back from his questions in fear and submission. Hopefully I'm not spoiling much for you there. So if you're you're wondering, how does this work? What could this look like? Well, stay tuned. But until then, would you join me in praying for God's help? Let's pray. Father, thank you that you are the one who directs all, sustains all, and knows all. Thank you that you are wise and in your wisdom you give out blessing and suffering. 
Father, would you give us humility to trust your wisdom? Father, would you give us fear to submit ourselves and our longings for answers to this trust in you? These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.